Welcome again to our online Bible study from Pine Valley Church of Christ as we continue our study of the book of Revelation. And we have been focusing on making sure that we truly look at this book within its uh, religious, its biblical and cultural setting and historical setting uh, to make sure that we're understanding uh, what John wanted his readers in the first century to understand and then apply it uh, to us rather than uh, some people tend to go the opposite direction with that. And also uh, get too involved in uh, small uh, details. And I pull up our... And here's our... lesson for today i want us to make sure that we are this is a picture of the amazon river basin uh, which i had the privilege of uh, flying over during a business trip to brazil one time and it's just it's massive it is awe-inspiring it is a beautiful thing and i was happy that i was in an airplane looking at it rather than if i was just standing down on the bank i might see uh, how wide the river is at certain parts uh, but you can't get the grandeur of it by focusing in on just one place. You have to be in a position where you're looking at it uh, so that you can see the whole picture. And as we move now beyond uh, the vision of uh, the letters to the seven churches, and God begins to reveal things uh, that he has said in chapter 1, uh, First, of the, he was going to reveal the things that are now, which was the letters to the seven churches in their current situation, and what was to come soon, or as he tells, uh, Jesus tells John here at the beginning of chapter four, uh, write down what I must reveal to you what is next. And so we want to make sure we're looking at that big picture. We've compared it to an impressionist art uh, you have to stand back from it. You have to look at it. Uh, if you get too close in, you can focus in on things. Uh, and you might understand that one particular part, but you miss the entire message. And we're going to see that same thing as we move along here in chapters four and five, as he begins to reveal uh, this, uh, as Jesus calls to him, like a voice, like a trumpet that we had heard earlier uh, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. And so that is uh, our focus and our approach as we enter into this lesson. Uh, and uh, I'll make reference to uh, biblical backgrounds to a lot of the imagery as we've already, some of it connects to imagery that's been used of the seven churches. Uh, but it's connecting us within the story of God. Uh, I've seen a lot of theories and things from uh, different interpretations of Revelation that bring in mythologies from Babylon and Egypt and so forth. And there might be some connection there that people might have been aware of some of those things. But God is putting all of this within the context of his revelation that has been taking place since the beginning of time. And so that's what he begins to share with us. And uh, chapter four uh, reminds us of who it is that is revealing these things to us. Uh, he is uh, the one who sits on the throne. Uh, and we see this uh opening picture that there is an open door before John uh, for him uh, to peer through and come through into this heavenly scene of the one who is sitting on the throne. And he de doesn't really spend any time uh, referring to uh, a description of the one on the throne, uh, except uh, vaguely. Uh, we have a picture of him, uh, the one on the throne from uh, Daniel chapter 7, of course, Ezekiel chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 6 uh, give us uh, much more detail of, of this uh, presence 
of the throne room of God. Uh, but here, the emphasis is upon uh, the glory and the worthiness of the one who is on the throne. The one who is going to reveal what must take place after this, because this is his plan and his thing. And we have this uh, picture of a throne. Uh, you know, there are precious stones around it, stones that are mentioned as being part of the breastplate of the high priest, of the Israelites. Uh, and through them is shining this light that makes a rainbow, uh, seems to be like a rainbow halo uh, encircling the entire throne. And of course, here is a, a biblical reference, I believe, back to the flood and what took place after the flood in Genesis chapter 9, where uh, it is God who promises to Noah and his family, and as he says at the end, this is my covenant with all living things, uh, that he would not uh, destroy the earth again by flood. And he had not done so at the time of the writing of Revelation. He still has not done so. And he is a God who keeps his promises. Uh, but it is shown, we are reminded of it by the rainbow in every sense. Uh, the picture here kind of reminds us, next time you see a rainbow, think about not only uh, God's promise, uh, but the glory of God himself. This is uh, the spectrum of light, uh, which we see so much associated with uh, the presence of God and even Jesus when he was transformed on the mountaintop. And uh, then we are introduced to sort of the next ring. We, we sort of go out in layers from the throne uh, next to these 24 elders. Uh, it's been speculated uh, different things for the meaning of the number 24. I think uh, within the context of Revelation, again, we need to let it interpret itself and when you go to the uh end of the book and he's talking about the new jerusalem that is coming down uh, there are 12 gates uh, in the city and above them each one is written the name of one of the 12 tribes of israel and then there are 12 foundations on which uh in each one is written the name of one of the 12 apostles and so here we have uh, 12, which was a complete number, uh, whether it's referring to the apostles, to the calendar of the year, or to the sons of Jacob. And when you double it, uh, it makes it even more of a perfect thing. Here is uh, those who have been part of the revealing of God's things and have experienced uh, his glory as representatives uh, for uh, the work of God uh, throughout the centuries. Uh, we're also introduced to seven torches that are around the throne, uh, which represent the seven spirits, and those are going to be mentioned again in a moment, and we'll talk about that more then. Uh, but the seven spirits had already been introduced to us in chapter one as being the spirits of God. Uh, we see in the letters uh, to uh, the church in Smyrna, he is um, the one, Jesus is the one who holds the seven, uh, not only the seven stars, but the seven spirits in his hand. And so again, we have this perfect number of seven uh, the connecting to that, to the days of creation and the completeness of it. And all of this has a, a tie-in, I believe, to uh, creation that is, it is going on. Uh, we have the mention of a sea of crystal in front of the throne, expanding in every direction. Uh, makes me think of uh, Genesis 
1, 1, and 2, in the beginning, you know, God creates the heavens and the earth, and he speaks it into being, and we are introduced to uh, the earth is covered in water, and the uh, Spirit of God is hovering over them, a scene that is recreated at the flood. Uh, when the earth again is covered in water and it is the spirit of God that helps uh, remove that water and a new creation is taking place and God makes his rainbow promise. Uh, we have the four living creatures are introduced. Uh, one representing the wild animals, the lion, one the ox, the domesticated animals. Then you have one representing humans and one representing uh, the birds of the air, and the eagle. It's This is the one who is worthy of praise and honor because all these things that have been going on since creation itself. And so we have sort of a paraphrase of Isaiah 6 in chapter 4, beginning in verse uh, 8. So when each of the four living creatures had six wings and covered with eyes all around and even under the wings and day and night, they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty who was and is and is to come. Uh, their way of ex expressing uh, the very being of Yahweh, I am, uh, the one who is the Lord God of Israel and of all those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. And every time they say this, the elders fall down and worship him and lay their crowns on the before the throne. In other words, complete subservience. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things by your will. They were created and have their being. This is who is revealing and why he is worthy and because of his uh, creation of us. Uh, the one who is now opening the door to give us a peek inside and to make sure that we understand, again, just who this is that we worship and why we worship in the fullness of his creation. And the might and power uh, exhibited in things like verse 5, thrown flashes of lightning, rumbling peals of thunder, uh, scenes from uh, Exodus chapter 19 when he descends upon uh, Mount Sinai before the people. Uh, and they are they all fall down before him. Uh, in great fear and awe of who their Lord God is. We move in chapter four, and I would encourage you to uh, go back and read Ezekiel one. It gives you a lot of background uh, to the imagery that is used here uh, for chapter four. Uh, we move into chapter five, which I would encourage you to go back and read uh, Ezekiel 2 and 3, uh, where there God uh, brings a scroll written on both sides uh, and unrolls it before Ezekiel and tells him to eat it or make it internal so that he has the words uh, to speak to his people. And that is a lot of the imagery behind uh, what is going on here, as well as in, uh, we'll see in the next lesson in chapters 5 and 6, uh, when the seven sealed scroll is opened. But here we have uh, the hand holding out uh, this scroll that it has seven seals. Again, a perfect number, the completeness indicating uh, the fullness and completeness of what is revealed there and that it is true. Uh, it is said that uh, in Roman politics that any uh, scroll that is sent forward with a message from the government, it had to have seven witnesses or seven seals on it to prove uh, that it was true. 
And that is a picture that we are given here. But immediately the question goes out, uh, who is worthy to break the seals and to reveal what is inside? And we're told that no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, in other words, covering the entire uh, spectrum of their reality, as has been revealed so far in Revelation, uh, no one of these created beings, uh, whether they're in heaven, on earth, or under the earth, or the realm of the dead, is worthy. And John weeps. He wants to know. He is, he's got that curiosity up now. He is like Daniel in many of his visions. He is seeking God's purpose. He is seeking God's plan and what he is going to do. And he weeps when no one is found, but the angel touches him and says, don't worry. Uh, there is, don't weep. See, the line of the tribe of Judah and the root of David has triumphed, and he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Uh, the line of Judah uh, refers back to the blessings that Jacob was giving his 12 sons at the end of his life. And he talks about a lion would come from Judah uh, to rule. It is in Isaiah 11 that we are told that uh, out of the root of Jesse, the father of David, uh, that a ruler would come and rule over the people. But it, the imagery immediately shifts as John looks uh, to the one who is being pointed to. And he said, and I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. And he had seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Here is... Uh, the lamb who has been crucified. Uh, it's interesting, except for one reference in 1 Peter, uh, John in his gospel and in the book of Revelation is the only one to uh, refer to Jesus in these terms as lamb. Uh, he records John the Baptist is telling his disciples, as Jesus walked by one day, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But this great victory that he has won has not been one of a military uh, victory uh, as we think of it in the world, as we would think of as being a part of the root of David or a lion of Judah. These are warrior type images that we might bring, but we're talking about a spiritual battle here and Jesus wins it uh, through sacrifice and not through battle or uh, victory of an earthly sense, but as one who has been sacrificed. In fact, uh, as we move on, the, that is the key thing that is mentioned several times. Uh, you are worthy, verse 9, because you were slain. Uh, verse 12, Worthy is the lamb who was slain. I think I prefer the translation of the word there as the one who has been slaughtered. Uh, slain you know, doesn't really carry with it the picture that is being given here. Uh, because John's readers would have been very familiar with what uh, took place either at the festivals of the Jews or even in pagan uh, rituals to uh, their pagan gods in sacrificing of a lamb. Uh, this was not uh, a single wound. Uh, it was uh, something that was, you know, they took the lamb uh, to the priest. Uh, he slit the throat, and hung them upside down to allow the blood to drain out of the body. The blood was then taken to the altar and thrown on the altar. 
as the blood has been given uh, by the lamb, uh, then the body was slit open lengthwise so that they could remove all of the internal organs uh, to be removed. And this is the kind of picture I think John is uh, wanting us to think of and draw for us here. This is the lamb who has been slaughtered uh, for us and why he is worthy to reveal uh, what God is about to do soon. And so he is given all of the uh, messages of uh, praise and glory and honor. Uh, but he makes sure again, uh, here are more pictures of uh, strength and you know the seven horns uh, or authority. It was also associated with horns or seven eyes, which were the seven spirits, which we were told go throughout the earth. So in other words, he is perfect in his authority. He is perfect in knowing what is going on and sees all that is taking place amongst his people. And he takes the scroll and is then declared worthy as they sing this new song, we are told, uh, beginning in uh, chapter 9. Uh, there are several references to uh, the heavenly beings, whether it's in Ezekiel, Isaiah, uh, here in Revelation, other places, uh, when a new song is sung uh, because of a, a new revelation, a new occasion has taken place, something to celebrate. And the basic themes are the same, though the wording changes in each of those instances. In this new song, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men from God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. This is something that has not just been for uh, the descendants of Abraham. This is something that has spread throughout the world to every tribe and language, people and nation. You've made them to become a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth, uh, which alludes back to a promise uh, and purpose that God told the Israelites in Exodus chapter 19 that he had for them, that they are a kingdom. They are their own people uh, and priests. In other words, they are to be his representatives to the nations around them. And uh, the idea that they will reign on the earth. Uh, Jesus mentions this in uh, John chapter 16, uh, that those who have given their lives to him, they will sit on, uh, he will sit on his throne and they will sit on 12 thrones uh, to judge the nations because they are the representatives of God. But again, we must understand the picture that is being given here and the nature of this kingdom and, and of its people goes back to its savior. Uh, the one who has been, uh, who has given himself, who has sacrificed himself and calls on his people uh, living in his kingdom to deny self and take up our cross and follow him uh, to the crucifixion and to the resurrection on the other side. And we'll discuss that more at the end. But toward the end of uh, chapter five, we are given again, uh, this picture is now, it has moved from uh, the throne room to he looks and he hears the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 of 10,000. And he encircled the throne and living creatures and the elders and the loud voice they cried, worthy is the lamb who is slain. Uh, notice the sevenfold uh, description of his worthiness. 
to receive power, wealth, riches, uh, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. He deserves the completeness and perfection of our worship because he is perfectly worthy to reveal the power of God and the plan of God. And it is to him that we give ourselves and he is worthy to carry out God's will uh, in this final age. And it is he who is going to begin opening the seals on the scroll, uh, as we'll see in the next lesson, and begins revealing uh, these mighty images, and again, that we want to look at uh, from a uh, very much like a parable. Uh, these are things Jesus revealed to his disciples through parables. You know, the kingdom of God is like uh, someone who found treasure in his uh, garden, or it is like a bush that grows up to something stronger and greater, or mustard seed. And all these types of images, and we're going to look at them in that way. But we want to make sure that we are keeping these images, this picture. And what are some important things we learn from these pictures in chapters four and five? Well, our God is creator and Lord of all things. Uh, our God keeps his promises. And the things that he is going to promise them here as he reveals the uh, will be kept again. Uh, our God is eternal. Uh, he is the one who is forever. He is the one who is, who was, and who will be. And he is the one, not any pagan God, uh, not Caesar or anyone else uh, that we should put our hope and trust in. Uh, but we give ourselves to the one who has created us and has kept his promises and will keep his promises, such as all the promises uh, to the seven churches when he told them uh, at the end of each of those letters, uh, to him who overcomes, to the one who hangs on, to the one who is victorious, these are the blessings that I will give you. And we'll see that play out over and over again in the rest of the book. And we must never lose sight of Jesus's victory was by sacrifice and that sacrifice is the nature of his kingdom and his people. It's been unfortunate uh, that throughout the years, uh, verses uh, like this, they will reign on the earth or he, he will reign with an iron scepter, uh, which is better translated. He will, he will rule with a shepherd's rod uh, like a shepherd. And that's much more the picture uh, that Jesus himself gives us. Uh, but verses like this have been used to justify uh, wars against people who are not Christians, uh, to justify uh, taking people that we consider uh, less or not as valuable uh, into slavery and to buy and sell their lives. Uh, to kill indigenous peoples, to take their land, you know, all in the name of we are spreading the kingdom. And uh, we have been given this authority by God to rule over the world. But that is not the kingdom of God. That is not the kingdom of Jesus Christ, of whom he is king and has become that king uh, through sacrifice. This is how we show the world we are different. I know uh, Christians today who are still looking forward to a time when Jesus comes back and rules on the earth and we take authority away from everybody else and we get to be the ones who are in charge. Again, that is not the picture that is given to us throughout scripture. It is one of the glory of God uh, and his plan and purpose as is carried out through Jesus's uh, death, burial, and resurrection. 
and he will come in judgment. And there will be that ultimate victory over evil. But in the meantime, we as the people of God, we hang on and we live according to those instructions that he gave the seven churches about the importance of uh, love and sacrifice. And we continue to focus on those things and show the world that we are not like the world and the kingdom is not like any kingdom on this earth. And that's what makes us different and will draw people to us. And he is the one worthy, Jesus is, to reveal God's word. He is the one John introduces his gospel as the word come in the flesh, the word that was uh, with God and the word that is God and through whom nothing that was created was created without the word that's spoken by God. And now here he is again, revealing the things to come uh, in a very special way and a powerful way to encourage these early Christians who are about to undergo what he referred to uh, back in chapter three as the trial that is coming upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. How will we respond to that? That is always the question. And we face uh, different kinds of trials and situations in our lives today. So how do we make sure that we overcome and hang on? Part of it is we remember who our God is and who our Savior, Jesus Christ, is. And that they are worthy of everything we have in terms of our love, our whole being. Love the Lord your God with everything you have. Give yourself completely to Jesus in sacrifice. And then live in his kingdom according to his direction and not by the ways of the world. Because as we are reminded here at the very end, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. They are worthy. And we must give ourselves to them completely every day. So we want to keep this scene, these uh, pictures that have been drawn for us in chapters four and five in our mind as we move forward uh, so that we can more fully understand the pictures or the parables that are to come. Our next lesson will focus on uh, the opening of the scroll, the breaking of the seven seals, uh, which begins uh, in chapter six, goes through the first verse of chapter eight. And so that's where we'll be going from here. I hope that you will join us again. And we look forward to uh, going through this uh, powerful images uh, that give us hope and encouragement in difficult times. Pray God will bless you between now and our next lesson. May he keep you healthy and safe.